Urzin Jan Song Suju Yaksan, this is why North Korea is preparing to attack Ukraine next. But it's not real life lore. What? North Korea? Why the hell would North Korea attack it? I get it, North Korea and China is like, a, you know, this kind of a partner type of thing with Russia. But I always assume this alliance is most like anti West than anything else. Like, it just makes sense, right? These people have bad relations with West, so they are like, you know, teaming up with each other, I guess. But North Korea, why would North Korea pre prepare to... I mean, China's not going to do it, obviously. China doesn't want all the problem that comes with it. But North Korea? Why would North Korea... I mean, I guess the problems that China would face is not the same that North Korea would face, right? Because North Korea is mostly closed up with uh, commerce and everything. So I guess it kind of makes sense. This was the moment they would choose because NATO is not going to attack North Korea for this. Same reason they are not attacking Russia because there's no NATO alliance with the Ukraine. But that would be weird. I don't, I don't know what repercussions this would have. But okay. I didn't see this coming. I guess we'll see. Yeah, Real Life Lore is like a great channel for things like this. Like more updates that I guess you don't see on news. This is weird. I don't even see this in news. That Then I hear something from Real Life Lore and then it comes to news some form. Or sometimes it doesn't even come to news. Like okay, I guess news doesn't even care anymore. But yeah, let's go this one. Remember people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe. So I know we start with videos to react to more. Check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. And yeah, let's do it. As the Russian invasion of Ukraine continues grinding through its second year, both sides are beginning to run low on their supplies of everything, from manpower to weapons and to ammunition that they require to continue fighting. The mm. most recent estimate from the United States in regards to the casualties suffered during Europe's biggest war since 1945 are absolutely horrendous. They believe that as of September 2023, the Russian casualties since the invasion began are fast approaching 300,000, divided between as many as 120,000 Russian soldiers killed in action, and as many as another 180,000 more wounded. These U.S. estimated losses on the Russian side are significantly higher than the U.S. estimated casualty figures for the Ukrainian side, however, which are believed to currently stand at around 190,000 total casualties, divided between an estimated 70,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed in action and another 120,000 more wounded. This makes for a total military casualty figure in the war only 19 months in, approaching a total of 500,000 when combining both sides' as totals, including nearly 200,000 soldiers who... All right, first of all, in the previous video, where, was it Real Life Lore video, Kings and General video? I don't know. But obviously, there are lots of comments that said, like, this is like propaganda, doesn't even make sense with this number, this is not mathematically possible. I think you're mistaking casualties with killed in action. Casualties account for everything. Like if you, because of some reason, you can't be on the field, you're a casualty. Even if you got a simple bullet in the leg, that's not life-threatening. You know, so, yeah. So any kind of injury is casualty, not just killed in action. So number of ways, like this doesn't feel that far off, right? I, I'm, I don't know which one is exaggerated or not, or which sources real life floor is seeing from, but probably real life floor is seeing multiple sources, not just one, and not all sources can lie. So, I mean, I don't know killed in action. And that's without factoring in any of the estimated loss in life to Ukrainian civilians, which the United Nations estimates to also be somewhere in the ballpark of the tens of thousands. This all easily makes the Russian invasion of Ukraine the bloodiest conflict seen in Europe since the Second World War, having already in less than two years eclipsed the total number of deaths experienced throughout the entire Yugoslav Wars that lasted for a Ten decade between years. 1991 and 2001. Damn with the Ukrainian side alone having already suffered higher losses than the United States did during nearly 20 years in Vietnam. Okay, see, that's the thing. That's why people say this is the major war for since World War II because this is a proper invasion war. Some of the wars are wars, but they are fought in certain pockets here and there. Uh, so some of the countries are so underpowered that they can't really defend against it. Sometimes it's against terrorism. Sometimes I guess it's some kind of militia. It's rarely against proper country versus proper country, a full-on invasion. This is the first of its kind since World War II. That's why like, people always say, what about this war? What about this war? This is not the first war. This type of war, this is first since World War II because it's a major scale one. And with the Russian side alone, having suffered more than double the losses of the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, which ultimately culminated in a revolution in the country. In the first two Did weeks alone of Ukraine's <laughs> massive... Did it though? Okay, I, I think the revolution was caused mostly because of the... Uh, loss itself rather than casualties because that was the last straw for people like really we, we lost against Japanese really and it was mostly hate against the Tsar Casual I think Russians throughout the years one thing I've noticed that Russians eat casualties is like it's nothing 
counteroffensive that began in June of 2023. The United States estimated that as much as 20% of all the weapons and equipment the Ukraine sent into battle was either destroyed or damaged. And the sheer scale of death and destruction that has been wrought in Ukraine God, on damn, both look at sides look at during this holes. war is reflective of the sheer... Look at the hole, lad. Like, this is like a fucking 50 BMG or something. Look at the hole. ...volume of lethal weapons and munitions that both sides have been firing at each other. It has been estimated by U.S. analysts that the Russian side in the war fired somewhere between 10 and 11 million rounds of artillery on the Ukrainian battlefield across 2022 alone, Almost would have to that say nothing costed. of how much they fired in 2023. On some days, according to the same American estimates, the Russians have been capable of maintaining a pace of firing between 20,000 and 50,000 rounds of artillery in Ukraine every single day, while the Ukrainians have only been managing to fire back at a rate of somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 shells of artillery a day. And after having kept these rates of fire up for 19 months now, both sides have burned through millions of rounds of artillery and small arms ammunition. And both sides' inventories and stockpiles of each are beginning to run low. And so, both sides have begun searching abroad beyond their own countries for newer sources to keep their guns supplied and firing long enough to last until the other side runs out first. And there is no larger source of stockpiled artillery shells and ammunition just sitting there unused in inventories anywhere in the world than on the Korean Peninsula, where North Korea and South Korea have remained officially at war with one another for more than 70 years oh. ever since the signing of a ceasefire agreement back in 1953, which ended the shooting between them but never officially ended the state of war between them. For decades, both the United States and Russia in its previous form, the Soviet Union, poured enormous amounts of weapons and ammunition into the hands of their respectively backed sides. The United States poured their weapons into South Korea while the Soviets poured their weapons into North Korea, as the fear on both sides of another hot war erupting on the Korean Peninsula between them remained ever-present. When the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union ended in the early 1990s, it never really ended at all in the Korean Peninsula and tensions remained extremely high through to the present, with both sides remaining prepared for the possibility of an all-out war resuming again, and with both sides having never winded down their vast stockpiles of artillery, rockets, ammunition, and guns built up over the decades preparing for it. As a result, the North and the South continue to possess what are literally the largest stockpiles of artillery shells and small arms ammunition that can be found anywhere in the entire world, with likely several tens of millions of rounds of artillery sitting there apiece. Damn, North Korea, in particular, is likely home to the single largest artillery arsenal of any of the world's countries, with at least 10,000 artillery systems that are more than every single country in NATO combined and with tens of millions of their own artillery shells stockpiled up for a war with the South. But they are personal those, being that old. Like, how much of them is going to be usable? South in the United States that for the past 70 years so far has still never come. North Korea may be a highly impoverished country with meager economic and technological power, but it has consistently over decades prioritized its military and armed forces above all other concerns of the state, with its regime constantly warning against an imminent U.S. invasion and urging the need for constant militaristic vigilance. Prior to the country developing and acquiring nuclear weapons, North Korea's greatest deterrent they had to dissuade against an invasion from the US and South Korea was its close relations with the Soviet Union and China, and above all, its massive and formidable military and artillery apparatus. North Korea, you see, has maintained compulsory military conscription in the country for all men for a period of at least 10 years, between the ages of 17 and 30, while North Korean women are selectively conscripted for military service as well until the age of 23, making North Korea easily the most heavily militarized society in the world in the 21st century, where at any given time roughly one in three people in the country are an active member of one of the nation's various military and paramilitary organizations. In terms of total numbers of soldiers and active military, reserve military, and paramilitary roles combined, North Korea literally has the largest armed forces in the world, with nearly mm. 8 million total soldiers it can call upon and field quickly during a conflict, significantly more than countries with way larger populations than it, like China, Russia, or the United States. The country with the second largest total armed forces it can quickly call upon, naturally, is South Korea, with a total of about 6.7 million total personnel it can call upon in the event of a conflict. And beyond the Damn, sheer enormity of North Korea's... I didn't know that. <sighs> North Korea and South Korea is literally the top two countries that can immediately call upon the troops just by just, you know, compulsory training and service, I guess. 
damn, that's that's something people don't think about every day. But kind of makes sense when you know history about how you know all the Korean wars happen and how it's still like pressure is still on. Damn, imagine shit like this again happens with South Korea and North Korea. I think the scale would be much bigger than Russia and Ukraine because just by the sheer number and how much they are basically preparing for it potential manpower base to pull from during a conflict. The other component of the country's deterrence historically was their massive investment into their artillery arsenal. A recent report from the RAND Corporation in 2020 concluded that North Korea continues to maintain around 6,000 of their total artillery systems near to the DMZ border with South Korea, within range of the very densely populated South Korean capital and largest city, Seoul the metropolitan region of which is home to more than 26 million people today, or about half of South Korea's entire population. That 2020 era report concluded that within the opening hour of a- I'm not gonna lie, with North Korea having nukes, that is not a good good <laughs> number there. Half of the people just in this Seoul area, yeah, that's a problematic. Full-scale hot war resuming on the Korean peninsula. North Korea's artillery systems along the DMZ could unleash what they've previously referred to as the Sea of Fire upon Seoul and the metropolitan area surrounding it. And in the process, kill upwards of 200,000 people in only a single hour through only conventional artillery without even resorting to their large chemical or nuclear. I think South Korea needs to get something like Iron Dome or something that Israel, Israel, right? Israel, I, I don't know, I forget it. Like Iran, Israel, but there is like a, a you know, this kind of like a, you know, dome type of thing they have that they can just defend against any missile coming, right? I think South Korea should th think about taking that because they really need it. You can never know when North Korea is going to go like, screw it, it's this time. Clear weapons arsenals. That is high enough of a possible carnage to make any U.S. president think twice about attacking the North. And so, this was what North Korea primarily relied upon for deterrence for decades. But then in the 2000s, they realized that that still might not actually be enough. Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which was conventionally formidable on paper with nearly 400,000 standing troops, 2,000 tanks, 2,300 artillery systems, 300 combat aircraft, and 4,000 anti-air guns was almost casually swept aside in little more than a month by the vastly conventionally and technologically superior US and UK forces who invaded Iraq in 2003, with only 196 coalition troops losing their lives compared to around 30,000 Iraqi troops. The primary justification that the US and UK had used to invade Iraq in 2003 was Saddam Hussein's position possession of weapons of mass destruction and his all nuclear weapons program. Something that all. turned out, Iraq didn't actually... Every time I see that, I still remember that Dave Chappelle skit. <laughs> it is insane. I love that him and his, that other guy basically in support of it. That him being the black bush or what is that, that skit? This is awesome. Have, which is what ultimately left them vulnerable to a US invasion. North Korea saw the writing on the wall and feared that they could become the target of the next U.S. invasion. So in the build-up to the invasion of Iraq, they decided to formally withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they had previously agreed to sign back in 1985, becoming, to date, the only country that has ever signed the treaty and then later withdrew from it. Almost immediately afterwards, North Korea resumed its nuclear weapons program, which culminated with their first successful test of a crude atomic bomb in 2006, and which eventually led to the current estimated arsenal of around four nuclear warheads, along with their increasingly sophisticated missile program designed to deliver those warheads to targets very far away from North Korea. The nukes Even and the missiles thus began adding to North Korea's level of deterrence against a U.S. invasion or intervention, spurred on even further after witnessing major U.S. military interventions against Gaddafi's Libya in 2011 and against the Assad regime in Syria in 2017 and 2018. But North Korea's nuclear weapons served another purpose to the Kim regime besides simply deterrence. They also served as a potential bargaining chip to try and get the United States to negotiate and compromise with them in order to ultimately get rid of them. You see, for decades following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, North Korea pursued a policy of attempted normalization with the United States instead, since they had just lost their primary supporter and benefactor and were attempting to break free from an increasingly assertive and overbearing China. Between 2012 and 2019, during Kim Jong-un's early years in power in Pyongyang, the North frequently made attempts at securing security guarantees and assurances from the United States and improving relations in exchange for addressing their nuclear weapons program. This policy culminated with the first meeting between then-U.S. President Donald Trump and Kim oh, yeah. Jong-un in Singapore in 2018. 
the very first time ever in history that the yeah. American and North Korean heads of state visited each other face to face, followed up by a second meeting between them the following year in February of 2019 in Hanoi, Vietnam. It was this second meeting between them in particular that went poorly, with Trump abruptly cutting the meeting short and saying that no agreement or I was compromise about to say that. could be reached. Look, man, Trump is great for this. Like, he, he, could, he probably is the only president who could have get this meeting done because what he represents or, you know, what his party represents at least. Yeah, so Donald Trump is the only guy that makes sense because of his views, his party's view to do this meeting. But at the same time, Donald Trump and his ego, like this was never happening in the first place. <laughs> it's just like you needed somebody to stroke, I guess, King Jong-un's ego and Trump is really not that. I bet he's just like, hmm, let's see if uh, King John gives me respect. That's what probably what his first thought was. Basically, both of them required top ego. Both of them wanted to be in top and I guess it didn't work. So that, that's the fucked up thing about it. Like this gave hope to the people. Like it's, it's not going to escalate. It's going to go low. But at the same time, Trump is not the one who's going to go down. So yeah, this was weird. Leading up to the meeting, the United States Senate had passed a clause which declared that the winding down of America's 22,000 troops deployed to South Korea was a non-negotiable item. Trump claimed that North Korea had requested an end to all U.S. sanctions on their country in exchange for surrendering their nuclear weapons, while the North's foreign minister conversely insisted that they had only requested a partial lifting of sanctions in exchange for beginning to wind down their nuclear program. Either way, Trump left the meeting without reaching any kind of deal with Kim, and Kim likely ended up feeling that Trump had rejected his offer. You see, that's the thing. For years, they're like, USS is an asshole. Then they meet with Trump. They're like, see, I told you US is an asshole, so I, I <laughs> just... It was after that that North Korea started distancing itself and became unengaged with Washington, hardly answering the phone or communicating with the United States at all in an apparent reassessment of its 30-year-long and failed policy of trying to normalize relations. After the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in July of 2021, North Korea possibly began believing that the United States was on the decline and began making clear signs that it was firmly realigning itself with its old Cold War era allies once again, Moscow and Beijing. Before the year had even ended, North Korea's government- US's economy is not declining, their armed forces and spending is not declining just because they left Afghanistan, so US is declining, what kind of a view is that? I guess whole North Korea thinks if you're not iron fisted, you are weak, so you're declining. I guess that's their mentality. Government expressed support for the Russian claims to the Kuril Islands, which are disputed with Japan, and further directly linked the controversy around Taiwan with the potential of triggering a resumption of the war in Korea. The final nail in the coffin for any hope of resumed negotiations between Washington and Pyongyang took place shortly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in March of 2022, when North Korea resumed testing and launching of its ICBMs that are capable of striking the U.S. mainland something that they had previously committed to not doing back in 2018, four years beforehand. During the negotiations with the Trump administration, North Korea would end up breaking its own record in 2022 for the most missiles it has ever launched in a single year. More than 70 of them, including a missile in October that flew over the Japanese main island of Honshu. See, the problem with that is I'm pretty sure U.S. could dwarf that number by 100 folds if U.S. wants to. But U.S. is a democracy, and all those generals, they just their palms are itching constantly. But U.S. Senate and Democrats are like, just chill out. Chill out, man, you can't do this. So U.S. have all the equipment, all the ammunition, but they can't because of the democracy. Otherwise, they, they would launch so many missiles, they would literally give earthquakes everywhere. After Russia unilaterally declared that it was annexing the Ukrainian provinces of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson into their country in September of 2022, North Korea further became one of the only countries in the world to ever recognize the Russian claims, the only other to date being Bashar al-Assad, Syria. And now in 2023, in an incredibly ironic twist of history and circumstance, it is the Russians and the Americans alike who are both coming back to their respective historically supported sides in the Korean Peninsula, asking for some of their previously gifted arms back in order to fight in another conflict, raging on the other side of Eurasia and Ukraine. And both North and South Korea... Where is US money going, man? Seriously, check out the chart where which country spends so much money where. US dwarfs top five of them by just sheer number. Like US spends so much money in military that even the top seven, I think it was top seven, top eight country combined, they don't spend it. 
right? US, if they don't have arms, where is that money going? Have been cooperating with them to a certain extent. Why do they need the to ask for South Korea? Don't they have already stockpiled somewhere? Between the two Korean arch rivals. Back in 2019, Vladimir Putin met with Kim Jong-un for the first time in their lives. Back then, it was Kim who was desperate for any kind of diplomatic lifeline with the outside world, after having just failed to reach that deal with Trump during the summit in Hanoi. And Putin was trying to position himself to become the great mediator between the Kim regime and Washington for further negotiations on denuclearization. But today, just four years later after that first meeting between Putin and Kim, the geopolitical reality in 2023 is vastly different. Now it is Russia who is increasingly becoming more and more isolated from the international community, owing to its massive invasion of Ukraine. With nearly every single country in Europe, plus the United States, Canada, the Bahamas, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, having levied financial sanctions against Moscow, and earning themselves a place on Russia's so-called list of unfriendly countries. Putin himself can also hardly travel anywhere in the world beyond Russia's own borders now, because of an arrest warrant that was issued for him by the International Criminal Court, or ICC, in The Hague on the 17th of March 2023, over alleged war crimes taking place during the invasion of Ukraine. As of the production of this video, Putin himself has not left the borders of Russia ever since the arrest warrant was made, though he does have a planned visit to China shortly, who does not recognize the ICC's authority. All of this. I mean, look, let's be honest, if Putin gets arrested, you really think Putin's military is just going to sit in his ass, right? Uh, come on, China, India, I'm pretty sure Putin can travel there and they're not, he's not going to get arrested. So even though West is the country he can't visit, there's a lot of land he can. This isolation that Putin and Russia alike are increasingly facing on the world stage has been pushing Putin to begin adopting a new post-Western foreign policy for Russia in search of new allies who are similarly opposed to the Western-led world order and who will help him both diplomatically and militarily in Ukraine. The problem with that is that there aren't many of those around who are willing to stick out their necks for him. China, perhaps Russia's greatest supporter of all diplomatically and economically, has been hardly supportive at all militarily so far, having apparently only sent the Russians a mere 100,000 bulletproof vests and helmets since the invasion began. There are very few countries who are willing to support the Russians militarily and run afoul of influential Western financial sanctions, as the countries who are currently sanctioning Russia collectively represent nearly 60% of the entire global economy. And so supporting Russia militarily would mean being sanctioned and getting locked out of that same 60% of the global economy. Thus, when it comes to countries who have given military aid to Ukraine during the war, the list is vast and includes dozens of countries from all across the world, including a whopping $44 billion worth of military aid given by the United States alone. The Russians have gained no such international military support to anywhere near the same kind of scale, and that has forced the Russians to basically only being able to go to other fellow pariah states, who are already under heavy Western financial sanctions and who thus don't really have have anything more to lose than they already have by choosing to help the Russians militarily, such as Iran and now North Korea as well. The Russians are known to have previously acquired thousands of Iranian-produced Shahed drones for use against Ukraine since the invasion began, while the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is known to have personnel within the Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine assisting the Russians with the operation and further manufacturing of these drones. Mm. And then, suddenly, in July of 2023, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu made an official state visit to Pyongyang in North Korea, becoming the very first Russian defense minister to ever visit the country since the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was obvious that the Russians desired access to the tens of... Basically, Russia saw that what is one of the most militarized countries in the world, basically North Korea, and they're like, if we secure them, like, we are set. What <laughs> kind of makes sense? Millions of artillery shells that were sitting there unused in North Korea's vast arsenal. Shells that were entirely based off of Soviet-era designs that are easily mutually compatible with the artillery systems that the Russians are currently using in Ukraine. North Korea's arsenal is almost certainly the largest ready-to-use stockpile of artillery that the Russians can easily use in Ukraine that can be found anywhere in the world outside of Russia's own borders. If the Russians could gain access to it, it would mean that North Korea could hypothetically supply the Russians with literally millions of rounds of artillery from these stockpiles and keep the Russian guns in Ukraine firing at full volume for at least another one or two years, and perhaps yep. even longer than that. Especially when considering North Korea's potential to manufacture even further artillery rounds for the Russian war machine. 
Having been completely and singularly focused on being prepared for total. See, Russia is seen as one of the top two military ready countries still needing help after two years like this. Still makes me think like how did Nazi Germany did it in World War II for so long for so many other enemies basically. It was attacked from all sides. It was basically single-handedly attacking everything. How did they have sort of enough ammunition and weapons? Obviously that's why they, basically that was their demise. They, you know, went out of resources. But even all the way they did it, how did they have it in the first place? Look at like even Russia is like struggling with their munitions. I mean, Ukraine understands Ukraine needs help. Why does Russia need help? Like, okay, this is this makes me really wonder like how did they do it in world wars? Like where they brought all the ammunition from? Total war for 70 years. North Korea runs a vast network of munitions factories within the country, including at least 100 different factories dedicated to munitions assembly, which collectively employ around 1 million North Korean laborers, or about 4% of the entire North Korean population strictly dedicated to building munitions. North Korea also has good rail and sea links directly with the bordering Russian Far East, meaning that North Korea could essentially serve as a very significant rear base of supplies for the Russian war machine in Ukraine, directly from providing there, yeah. millions of rounds of stockpiled artillery in addition to rockets and small arms ammunition for the Russians to carry across their whole country towards the military front line in Ukraine. A rear base that also cannot easily be interfered with, not only because of its sheer distance away from the front line, but also because of North Korea's remaining nuclear weapons arsenal and their ability and willingness to massively retaliate. Moreover, yeah. North Korea potentially came to That's the conclusion all, yeah, on the like, yeah, It's not easy to fuck with North Korea, so you can't even try to do anything. And you don't know where, how North Korea would respond, like how volatile they are. So yeah, this is risky. Without the possibility for any further diplomacy or negotiations with the United States, and no hope of normalized relations with them, their nuclear arsenal was never going to go anywhere, because it will never end up being used as a bargaining chip to try and improve relations and reduce sanctions. Meaning that their only remaining purpose is strictly for deterrence. And since they will always have the nukes for deterrence, they don't really need as much of their earlier deterrent that they were using before the nukes. Their massive artillery arsenal and sea of fire that could obliterate Seoul within an hour, which they can now safely exchange with the Russians for things that they actually do need right now. Naturally, in exchange for giving the Russians millions of rounds of their artillery. Seriously, North Korea could take a lot of things for Russia. Like, doesn't matter what is the state of Russia, the technology they have, apart from US, they are the top of it, right? Apart from US, like all the things they have, all the technology that North Korea really doesn't have, they can get it. They can bargain for it. And that will just improve North Korean military going forward. The North Koreans are going to want things in return. North Korea has been completely shut down and isolated from the rest of the outside world ever since January of 2020, during a self-imposed and extremely strictly enforced quarantine over the COVID-19 pandemic in which extensive new border fortifications have been constructed all along the northern frontiers with China and Russia, and shoot-to-kill orders were given to all border guards for anyone caught trying to enter or leave the country from any direction, an order that has remained in force for over three years now. This severely cut down on the numbers of defectors successfully escaping from North Korea, as well as the volume of illicit smuggled foreign contraband getting into North Korea like hard drives, books, and SD cards. But it also severely cut down on North Korea's critical imports of things like food, spare parts, and fuel, which have all evidently become a scarcity within the Hermit Kingdom once again. So North Korea wants food, spare parts, and energy resources from the Russians at a bare minimum. They also want Russia to drop their sanctions on North Korea and resume normal trade relations. And they also want the Russians to help them circumvent their own financial sanctions that are being imposed by the West, in a growing, sort of underground trade network between the world's most heavily sanctioned countries. Russia, North Korea, Iran, Syria, and Belarus. Further, they perhaps also want the Russians to provide them with even more things as well, such as more advanced fighter aircraft like the modern Russian-produced SU. Okay, you know what, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not so sure about the new trend that Real Life Lore is doing with the extended videos of 40 plus minutes or something like that. Because so far, only thing I've heard from this video is how North Korea is helping Russia with ammunition, not how North Korea is preparing to attack Ukraine. Right? I don't even know if that's the point or he just means supplying uh, Russia. But if, if there is something about North Korea trying to attack, like it's 20 minutes still not has been said. And all the mini history lesson here and there. I get it, you know, I, I don't mind it personally, but I feel like people who are like short span will not be watching 40 minutes video. So I don't know, I feel like his old 15, 20 minute setup was perfect. 40, 50 minutes, I mean, it can get stressed out, I guess. 
but yeah but i don't know i feel like north korea directly attacking would not be a thing i think the main point is just that they're going to help out russia with munitions that's going to be the point U-35 and Su-57, both of which the Russians have recently been struggling to sell to any customers abroad, and which from Moscow's perspective could be better to at least trade with North Korea for something rather than sitting around and doing nothing. The Russians could even help the North Koreans tremendously by only providing them with slightly older and less capable fighters than the modern cutting-edge ones, considering that the North Korean Air Force right now is incredibly outdated, and largely consists of fighters and ground attack craft like the MiG-29 and the Su-25 Frankfurt that began production back in 1981 and 1978 respectively, more than four decades ago. The North Koreans might even simply be satisfied with receiving aviation spare parts to keep these old aircraft running. They also might want advanced Russian anti-air systems to better defend their nuclear missile launch sites from possible American or South Korean air attacks, such as the S-300 or S-400 Russian-built systems. Yeah. And then, potentially getting a little more demandy, the Submarines. North may also be interested in acquiring highly sensitive Russian nuclear submarine technology, yeah, that's submarine the launched ballistic missile technology, or even more advanced. Imagine if, uh, you know, North Korea had nuclear subs basically long range nuclear subs that's just like that would give heart attack to everyone especially us like north korea could undetectably go near i don't know new york or something just launch nukes from there that would be a, too much let's just say advanced rocket and i don't think russia is going to do that because it also means that north korea just in power can get close to russia because nuclear subs are like the key things in your arsenal if you have it Missile propulsion and evasion technology to assist them further with their own reconnaissance satellite program in perfecting their ICBM's range and ability to break through Western anti-air systems. These latter items, though, are perhaps things that the Russians will still be highly reluctant to give to the North Koreans simply in exchange for mere conventional and unguided artillery, rockets, and small arms ammunition. Especially not when Russia could get away with trading some of their abundant and cheap oil and gas for them instead, or looted grains that they've pillaged from Ukraine and transported over effectively for free. And as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, Russia could also offer North Korea substantially further diplomatic support at the UN as well which, to an extent, has already been taking place since the invasion began. Ever since 2019, Russia has consistently rejected any new sanctions being slapped on North Korea by the UN. And in 2022, Moscow wouldn't even support a UN statement condemning North Korea for its launching of ICBMs. North Korea could easily depend on further Russian diplomatic protection at the UN like this, and potentially even count on a full-on de facto normalization of relations with Russia, akin to how things used to be back during the Cold War Soviet era. Maybe not as ideal as a normalization with the United States, but from Pyongyang perspective, better Moscow than nothing. Regardless, both Russia and North Korea clearly have a lot to offer each other right now, and sure enough, in September of 2023, Kim Jong-un himself took the decision to finally leave his country for the first time in four years by getting aboard his personal armored train and steaming across the border into the Russian Far East to meet directly with Vladimir Putin face to face for the second ever time in their lives to discuss the terms of a potential deal like this. After Wait a minute, did he take train from North Korea? all the way to russia why is there a why is there a track that goes from north korea to r r russia i guess from the soviet times that's weird okay alliance is not that hard to see yeah alliance is not that hard to see because uh, this was inevitable right because there are certain countries like north korea who's like mostly militarized was anti-west a lot they needed some conflict like this to make alliances because this will benefit them because whatever help they give now russia will remember and going forward even a decade or from now the alliances will help them going forward so, yeah. Afterwards, Putin and Kim even agreed that Putin himself would personally come down to North Korea next and visit Pyongyang at an undetermined future date. The first time that Putin will visit the country since the last time he did 23 years previously, <laughs> all the way back in 2000, shortly after he first assumed power in Russia and met with Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-un. Didn't he assume power in 95 or 96 or something? Yeah. Now, the U.S. has been accusing the North Koreans of providing the Russians with weapons ever since 2022, but these had always been believed to be low, fairly insignificant volumes. The North was keen to put on an air of plausible deniability out of the fear of escalating tensions further with South Korea and the U.S. at home on the Korean Peninsula, while the Russians were likely attempting to test drive the North Korean stockpiles to see if they actually worked well enough to their satisfaction. You see, there has been a very high degree of, very high degree of uncertainty over the quality of North Korea's All massive... Of this 
works, definitely works. For decades. Most of their artillery shells are dumb, unguided ones that were largely manufactured decades ago back in the 1980s and 1990s. Back in 2010, the South Koreans carried out an artillery exercise in waters that North Korea claimed were their own territorial waters. In retaliation, North Korean artillery guns opened fire on the populated South Korean island of Yonpyong, firing a total of around 170 shells and killing four people in the process. According to a later report on the incident produced by the Washington-based 38 North Project, more than half of the artillery rounds fired by the North Koreans during that attack missed their target completely and landed in the waters around the island. You know what, I'm going to stop here like, because I think that most of this video is like how uh, North Korea is helping Russia with ammunition and things. I don't know, preparing to attack Ukraine is like strong. But so far I've seen is just like how uh, North Korea is helping, uh, you know, Russia invade Ukraine with ammunition and things. Kind of makes sense when you think about it. Their alliance would work in a way. Russia can give a lot of like equipment uh, to North Korea, uh, submarines and things. So yeah. Well, Alright, well, that was uh, why North Korea is preparing to attack Ukraine next or helping uh, Russia at least. Watch on Real Life Floor. If you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time.